Welcome uh, to this edition of Have Your Say, uh, an interactive session. My name is Ajuri Ngalali. Uh, I humbly serve as the Senior Special Assistant to President Mohamedou Buhari on Public Affairs. And it's certainly a privilege uh, to be with you uh, today. Really looking forward to getting your questions. Uh, of course, today being May 29th, uh, this is the one-year commemoration uh, of the second-term administration of President Mohamedou Buhari. And so many things uh, have, of course, occurred over the last one year, over the last five years, in fact. Uh, and I'm looking forward to getting questions that would uh, get into some of the hard issues uh, that uh, concern you, uh, concern our people at large. Uh, and so with that, uh, the phone lines, as you can see, uh, the phone line there, the call-in line is available on the screen just below. Uh, you can also see the WhatsApp line uh, where you can send in your messages, your thoughts, your comments, and, and certainly we're going to do our very best uh, to accommodate as many of our people as we possibly can. Uh, we certainly want to engage with you, and I can assure you that this will not be the last time uh, that we uh, conduct uh, this kind of an interactive session, the first of many. Uh, so with that, please do call in. Uh, I look forward to uh, getting your calls. Thank you very much. It's worth noting uh, that as we await the first caller, because I believe there, there's some engagement on the phone lines, uh, that uh, we have so many areas uh, to go into. Obviously, when we talk about economic diversification, we talk about agriculture, uh, we're looking at the COVID-19 response in terms of uh, the economic sustainability plan. Of Green course, uh, one issue uh, that is burning on the minds and hearts of our people uh, certainly would be the power sector. All right, I'm out to Honorable Office A to the President of Public Affairs. Not just with words, but with action. Uh, All right, uh, a quick uh, one. Uh, job creation. Uh, so, of course, we know that you have lots what of did questions. You say? And I can assure you that uh, we're going to do the very best we can uh, to make sure that okay. we get you the answers to those questions. And where that is not possible, I'll make sure that I follow up uh, on my Twitter handle. Uh, with the answers to those questions. Uh, and my Twitter handle is at Ajuri Ngalali. That's at symbol A-J-U-R-I-N-G-E-L-A-L-E. -L -L -E. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. All right, morning, uh, Galali. Hello? I can't hear him. Yes. Okay. Yeah, morning, Mr. Aguri. I cannot hear it in my earpiece, please. If you can just uh, speak up a little bit louder, I cannot hear it in my earpiece. Yes. I, yes, I, I can hear, hear you now. I can hear you now. Confirm that he can hear me. I can hear you, please. Thank you very much for calling in. All right, let me go ahead. Uh, I, uh, today marks the... Uh, First uh, year of the second term of a uh, PND led administration. And in commemoration of the second term, 355 days of his administration, I want to commend Mr. President and his vice for the massive infrastructural development across the nation, the diversification of the economy as well, and improved the security while giving us peace and stability as a, as a country. 
Uh, there are a lot of questions I would have wanted to ask, but let me limit myself for the benefit of the uh, others on the queue, because I know others will be on the queue to call in. So straight on to my question. We've heard so much about uh, economic diversification, but the last uh, I checked, our oil revenues are still from about 90% of our foreign exchange earnings. So I would really want to know what this administration is doing with regarding that. Thank you very much, my brother. Uh, may you I have your me? name, please? Your name. My name is Anya Kanudoyo, Prince. Let me paraphrase the question again. We hear so much about... No, I, I heard the question. I, no, my brother, the last time I, I, I heard checked, the question. Our oil revenues still far. Yes, I, I, I heard the question. Thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure I got your name. So thank you for uh, calling in, Prince. Uh, the question you've asked is a very important question uh, for many reasons. Obviously, when we talk about economic diversification, moving into agriculture, uh, moving away from oil and gas revenues, uh, we, we have to understand exactly how this works. Because this is a question I've gotten a lot as I've called in radio stations around the country. Many people have said, ah, if, we're earning, if we were earning 90% 90, uh, 90 plus of our foreign earnings from oil and gas uh, in 2015, and we're still earning 90% plus uh, from oil and gas, that means that we haven't diversified. This is how it works. There are three levels to this thing. The first level is where we were in 2015, where you are a consumption-based import dependent economy right that means you are essentially importing everything from what you eat all the food all the rice all the toothpicks all the pharmaceuticals pretty much everything you can import you're importing it which means that essentially our people are paying for factories in vietnam germany and other countries to stay open creating jobs in those countries while we deny ourselves those jobs because we're not producing we're just consuming imports that's where we were in 2015. so the second level is to substitute those imports, right? Uh, those import, uh, all those imported items with locally produced items. That means that we have factories open, we have industries open that are employing our people, paying taxes to government. We're producing what we're consuming. Uh, we're, uh, yeah, we're producing exactly what we're consuming. That's the second level. Where we have come from is to say that it, when, in 2015, when we were paying about three billion US dollars every year just to import rice alone, we have been able to cut that by more than 95%. That means that that $3 billion we would have spent every year on rice since 2015, we're now able to use, uh, to, for example, to partially fund our budget, just for example. So we have done a lot in terms of import substitution. So getting to that second level where you meet food self-sufficiency and uh, self-sufficiency in terms of local production meeting uh, local demand. It is now from that point that you now try and get to the third level. What is the third level? Is the final destination where we all want to get to, which is a production-based export economy instead of a consumption-based import economy. That's the third level. So now you cannot get to the third level without going through the second because it is the surplus of what you're producing locally to meet local demand that you will now export to the international communities, right, uh, to the international community. And so that is where we are. Right now we're at the cusp of, number, of, of, of part two, self-sufficiency, uh, local production, ramping it up. And then by 2023, and many of the agricultural items that we were importing in 2020, 2015 that we have now substituted for local uh, consumption, we're now able to now e export the surplus as we continue uh, bolstering our production across all of the value chains. So diversification is a process. It's not overnight, which is why many governments that preceded President Mohamedou Buhari's administration failed to even embark on the journey. But we have started on the journey. We've taken the steps that we need to uh, take. And of course, uh, that, that means that uh, we're going to get there. But we, we just have to be a little bit patient. So once we get beyond the threshold of the second level uh, in terms of self-sufficiency, you're going to be able to now see as we're exporting these items, you're going to be seeing us tick down from the ratio of oil and gas, uh, uh, of our forex earnings from oil and gas from 90% down to 88, down to 85, down to 83, and onwards. So it's a progressive thing, but we first have to get to self-sufficiency, and that's what this uh, administration has, has done very successfully. So we're definitely not where we want to be, but we are making very serious progress toward getting to that point. Yeah, I'm on the line. How are you, my brother? Thank you for calling in. Uh, uh, did you pick my first question? 
All right. The other ones are, are for the other questions. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Phone lines are open. Uh, please do participate. This is all about making sure that we were answering those tough questions, those questions that you feel when you're watching TV and radio and you're wanting the journalist to ask that question that you really want to have asked. Uh, th this is an opportunity, so please do engage with us, participate. Let's, let's get those uh, core questions answered with facts, verifiable facts. And I, I would just challenge all of our was uh, to fact check everything that's being said here. Everything that I have to say, make sure you go and verify it uh, so that you're not being misled by either me, of course, which I would never do anyway, uh, but and then, of course, those who uh, call in. Thank you. It's worth noting that, uh, as you can see there, there's also a WhatsApp line for messages. So not every, if you're, if you're finding that calling in is difficult or there's some sort of uh, traffic there on the call-in line, uh, feel free to drop uh, your question and contribution on the, uh, on the WhatsApp line so that uh, we can make sure that we uh, address as many of these issues as we can and hopefully we don't lose too much time in between uh, questions due to uh, technical issues. You have a caller on the line? If we don't have a caller on the line, uh, we can just, if there's some traffic there, you can just bring in the questions and uh, I'll, I can take them manually. That's not a problem at all. I want to make sure that our people get their, their questions answered as promptly as possible, please. Okay, due to some technical difficulties, we're going to go ahead and get these, these questions sent directly. All right. Okay, so the next question that we have we're expecting a caller now. Okay, I'm I'm going to go ahead and read out a WhatsApp question. Okay, all right, the caller is on the line. Great. Thank you. Actually, uh, I call to ask this question. Yeah, my name is my name is uh, my name is uh, my name is uh, yeah. Please go, go ahead, my, my brother. My name is Sophilos Uchechuku. Okay, thank you very much. I am for calling time. from River State, Potako, to be precise. I have 
this question for him. The, actually, the president has been laying claims to some projects done by other governments. So I, my question is, which projects will this government start and complete? Thank, thank you very much, uh, Theophilus uh, Utachuku, for your time. Uh, let me just, you know, be very, very clear uh, in under, you know, in really articulating the fact that governance is a continuum, right? And unfortunately, we get into, caught up in these political narratives about PDP, APC, APCA, and whatever parties would come up in the future. Uh, and we're not uh, focused enough on Nigeria, uh, on the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and the fact that all of us, regardless of any political uh, uh, nomenclature, uh, have a stake in this country. And so uh, it's, it's, the, the focus should not be on wh what administration, the focus should be on uh, whether government is being responsible and making sure that uh, projects that would enhance uh, the socioeconomic well-being of our people uh, are prioritized and completed, no matter who started them. And we're very blessed uh, that we have a president now, and President Mohamedou Buhari, who understands that if there is a project, regardless of whether it was started under President Obasanjo, President Jaradwa, or President uh, Jonathan, uh, if it's a project that is socioeconomically beneficial, bene uh, beneficial to our people, he is going to invest in that project. He is going to uh, bring it to completion. Because unfortunately, what we had under uh, previous uh, administrations was a situation where everybody wanted to start projects, wanted to issue contracts. So every new project was a good idea. And so you would have so many different projects across the country abandoned at 5%, 10%, 12%, 25%, 40%, and all of that. Nothing, nothing was getting completed. Very few things were getting completed, particularly on the high value uh, you know, projects like, look at the Lagos Ibadan Expressway, for example, that was kept for decades. Uh, Second Niger Bridge was a drawing on a piece of paper for decades. All of these things, it's, it's as a result of the fact that uh, when it came to high-value construction projects, for example, that there was underinvestment, and then where money was uh, funneled to ultimately didn't reach the destination because of diversion and misappropriation and all of that. So the president has now said, okay, look, so many projects have been started, many of which uh, were not even close to completion. I am going to be the person that completes those projects, not because I want people to praise my name, but because I want our people to benefit from those projects. I want those roads and bridges and airports and seaports and power plants and dams completed so that we can attract the kind of investment that will now massively employ our people on a sustainable basis. So the president is not concerned about who starts and completes what project. But since you have asked me, I must now answer you. The second Niger Bridge is a perfect example of a, of a project that was nothing, absolutely nothing, not even one pillar on the ground. And now we can see uh, the 206 billion Naira project uh, is well, well, uh, well underway. Uh, all the pillars are erected. In fact, we're now at the point of laying the bridge on top of the pillars. The pictures are out there everywhere to verify. Uh, of course, everybody knows that nothing was there before. So you have something that started and will be completed by 2022. I believe uh, February 2022 is the completion date, well before the end of this second term administration. That's just one project. Look at the Lagos Ibadan, uh, sorry, the Lagos Ibadan rail line uh, that by 2017, there, it did not exist. It did not exist. Now there is a high speed, fully finished high speed rail line from uh, Iju in Lagos all the way to Ibadan, where people have been uh, engaging in free rides and all of that. So we have projects that the president started and finished. That's not even the, the challenge. The challenge is now about making sure that we understand that government is a continuum and that there are, proje that there are projects that the president will start and the next administration, hopefully, if they're mature and responsible like the president is, they will finish those projects. Uh, because ultimately, it's about Nigerians. It's not about APC, PDP, APGA. It's about Nigerians and what is in the best interest of our people. And the president understands that uh, more than uh, any president we have ever seen before. And the proof is in the pudding on that. So thank you very much for your question, for your time, and for your contribution. Um, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. All right, we have another caller on the line.
I can hear you now. Yeah, good morning, sir. Good morning, my dear brother. Thank you for your time. Can I proceed? Oh, all right, yeah. Good morning, sir. This is Gabriel Lachet speaking. We really appreciate your giant achievement, and particularly to your officer. Sir, I wouldn't mind. Thanks for the opportunity given to me to ask the question. Sir. I have a question to ask, sir. The question goes like this. In terms of foreign policy, in terms of foreign policy, what standing does Nigeria truly have in the world? That's number one. In terms of foreign policy, what standing does Nigeria truly have in the world? We have been in a consuming path, importing country for as long as I have been alive and I have several decades in age. We do not seem able to deal with our problems effectively. So, why would the war take us serious in 2020 We have that? That's my question, sir, with due respect. Th thank you very much, uh, my dear brother, for the time uh, and a very interesting question. Uh, look, uh, I want to just start by saying that uh, this office, uh, of, yes, this public affairs office uh, is about engagement. Okay. It's really not about uh, achievements or what one has done or not done. Ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, public servants are meant to just do their job. That's what we're here to do. Uh, so I don't think that that's worthy of celebration. What should be celebrated, however, is that we have 21 years now uh, of consecutive uh, democratic uh, governance in the country. Uh, even though we've had our difficulties, we've had our blips, we've had uh, abuses of power over the last 21 years, we've had our challenges, but the fact that we have arrived here without any interruption uh, to the Fourth Republic, I think, is a testament to the will of our people uh, and uh, the, the determination of our people to ensure that uh, their voices are heard in terms of uh, democratic governance. With that said, the important, uh, the, the question you have asked is very, very strategic because if you look at foreign policy historically in Nigeria, there's no doubt about the fact that we have been very careless. Uh, and I'm not just talking of in the Fourth Republic, I'm talking of uh, for, for decades now. Pretty much any time anybody wants some sort of an intervention, whether it's Sierra Leone or uh, any other uh, country, uh, they call Nigeria, and we, don't, we, we have not often asked enough uh, questions about what Nigeria stands to, stands to lose and stands to gain from some of the things that we have been doing in the past. That has now changed. Uh, as opposed to having a directionless uh, foreign policy where we just intervene in different places and then claim to be big brother to everybody, what the president has done is he has made a strategic pivot, and he has said, look, our, our foreign policy is going to be directed on the basis of what is in the best interest of Nigeria. So he has now thrusted into economic diplomacy. That means that any engagement we are making with other nations, there must be a tangible, derivable benefit for our people in the form of bilateral agreements, engagements, in the form of MOUs, in the form of implementable contracts. Whatever it is, there must be a benefit on behalf of our people. And I can be very specific about what I'm talking about. Just in the last few years, President Mohamedou Buhari has gone to Russia, where he signed a deal uh, for, uh, for the provision of uh, MI-35 MI attack helicopters to uh, uh, bolster our, our, our defense capabilities. He has signed a, another deal with uh, the Russians to uh, gain training for uh, the Nigerian Navy in terms of anti-piracy, because the Russians have of experience in terms of dealing with oil and gas maritime security uh, in, the, in the Black Sea and other places. Uh, so we're able to get that expertise. Uh, we also were able to get the Russians to agree to a $1.4 billion deal for them to come and do a full resurrection of the $5 billion Ajeo Kuta steel complex, uh, as well as uh, work in the Nigerian iron ore mining company in conjunction with the Frexen Bank. All of that was done just with Russia alone, not to speak with what we've done with Brazil. The president negotiated the Green Imperative Deal, a $1.2 billion uh, initiative to uh, mechanize our agricultural process. I'm sure at some point we'll be able to get into that in depth, hopefully during this program. Uh, but all these things, uh, every uh, relationship we develop, even with the U.S. in terms of the fighter jets and all of that, it, it's all based on reciprocity. It's all based on mutual benefit. And for us, that's very, very important. So yes, uh, there's no doubt when you look at the, uh, the deals we've been able to strike, when you look at the, the frequency with which we're now able to get a bachelute returned, 
uh, for example, the frequency uh, of the return shows that there is enhanced confidence in terms of uh, how we are uh, uh, running governance in Nigeria now as opposed to before. And we're going to continue to see increased investments and increased uh, bilateral uh, economic relationships and the growth of such uh, as we move on. So are we where we want to be? Uh, I wouldn't say that, but I would certainly say that we've made a lot of progress in terms of developing the respect of nations uh, uh, in terms of how they view the Nigerian government and how they want to cooperate with the Nigerian government. And it also helps that, of course, President Muhammadu Buhari is known globally uh, as a man of integrity. And so obviously we saw the African Union name President Muhammadu Buhari as the, uh, as the African Union champion for anti-corruption. The reason why that was done is because of who he is as a man and because they have seen not just who he is as a person, but in terms of his administration, uh, that uh, the corruption war has been given a lot of fight, a lot of energy, a lot of uh, officials have been put in jail, uh, many, many of whom are, are APC members, for example. Uh, we have seen a situation where uh, the, uh, the corruption uh, fight has obviously been bolstered, and we have evidence to that effect. Nigerians have seen uh, unprecedented rate of recoveries. So there are so many things that go go into uh, developing and, and bolstering our standing in the world. And I think the president uh, has strategically put us in a position where uh, we can be respected in a way that we weren't respected just a few years ago. All right, thank you. All right, sir. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take... Is there a caller on the line? Okay, there's a caller on the line. After this caller... Hello, good morning. Oh, good morning to you, my brother. Yeah, my name is um, Shalai Manuel Colin. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, please, I... Yeah. Hello? Okay, please, um, I have a question for the special advisor for the president. Okay, yeah. My question is um, um, about this um, pandemic, this pandemic called coronavirus. Um, because um, coronavirus has actually made not just my life, but the whole of life very challenging. Yeah? And I hear, about, uh, I hear a lot about the president talking about the post-corona economic plan. How will this actually affect me, this post-corona economic plan? How will it affect me? What is it, what is it simulate all about? What is it all about? Can you just explain to me in a layman understanding what is it all about? Yes, absolutely, Shola. Uh, it would be my, my privilege to do so. Uh, thank you for calling in and thank you for that question because I know it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one that's a wide concern, especially right now. It's a very timely one. Uh, well, look, the, the Economic Sustainability Plan uh, is uh, derivable from uh, the Economic Sustainable, uh, Sustainability Committee that was constituted by President Muhammadu Buhari uh, and chaired by Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibajo uh, with membership that includes the leaders of all, of, of all spheres of the economy. So you have the CBN governor, you have the NNPC GMD, you have the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning. You also have uh, the ministers of very critical job-creating ministries, uh, ministry, uh, Minister of uh, Agriculture, Minister of uh, Industry, Trade and Investment, uh, and several others, works, etc., transportation, etc. Now, the thrust of the plan is a, essentially a two trillion naira, approximately a two trillion naira plan, and it, it, it is a stimulus, which means that this is not your traditional... Uh, a committee that's put together by a Nigerian government, uh, like we've seen in years past, where you know, a committee comes together, they form a document, and that document gathers dust somewhere. This is not that. This is a stimulus. So that means that we have to implement it very quickly and very efficiently, because the sooner we implement it, the, the higher the chance, the higher the probability that we'll be able to mitigate the, ex the extent to which we have gone into recession. So, so, so these are these are these are some of the these are some of the uh, the the the, okay. the um, kinds of. I, I'm sorry. There's somebody on the on the line that's in my ear, please. Hello. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. So there, sorry. There was a bit of an interruption there. So just as I finish my response, the Economic Sustainability Committee has uh, uh, aims to create about 30 million jobs. 
uh, within a timeline of now and the next 12 months. That means every job that is created within the plan must be fully uh, activated, operationalized, that there are going to be 30 million Nigerians employed uh, by the 12th month. That's what it means. So it's, it's stimulus. It's immediate. Now, how it works is based on the premise that we have to rebuild this country across sectors, and we have to do it in a manner that, uh, that maximizes Nigerian input. That means that only Nigerian indigenous companies will be involved, that employ only indigenous Nigerian labor, that use only indigenous Nigerian raw materials. So if you're constructing a road, you must use Nigerian bitumen. If you're constructing a house, you must use Nigerian uh, sand and concrete, all of these different elements that will, uh, uh, that will uh, uh, produce the concrete and all of the other uh, elements. They must be all Nigerian. So every element, direct and indirect jobs, are, are based in this country. Now, in, uh, you go across sectors. Let me start with agriculture. In agriculture, the Minister of Agriculture, as part of the plan, uh, ha has now created in, uh, in conjunction with the uh, Economic Sustainability Committee, they, a, a, a template for 10 million jobs to be created. How? Because the vice president is not just the chairman of the Economic Sustainability Committee, but is also the chairman of the National Economic Council, which obviously has the 36 state governors, the Economic Sustainability Committee is now able to work very closely with NEC and the state governors to ensure that all of the federal interventions are making it down to the ward level when we, as we're implementing this plan. So the implication in agriculture is that the governors under NEC had agreed to give thousands of hectares of land uh, to, uh, to uh, the uh, federal government to be able to send out millions of young people to do an unprecedented land uh, cult uh, clearing and cultivation exercise. And we're targeting those value chains that are, have high export earning potential that we had not been able to get into. You know, we've done a lot of work, like I said, over the last five years in terms of import substitution and rice and wheat and sugar and fish and all of that. But we really now want to go into beef, dairy, cocoa production right and all of that and we we see this as an opportunity to get our young people massively employed while creating sustainable jobs on new farmlands across the country that will be created through this land clearing and cultivation scheme uh, that is part of the economic sustainability plan so that's on the agri uh, agricultural side of it on the other side of it we are embarking on the most ambitious social housing construction scheme in the history of this nation we are in the first phase we are going to construct about 300,000 social, uh, social, uh, 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 social houses where you're now going to have social housing being housing that is affordable to the, the average Nigerian. That is, uh, at the houses will be, uh, when they're finished, will be worth between 2 million and 4 million naira. And we're going to be able to offer mortgage packages to people that will go as low as 15,000 naira to about uh, 25 to 30,000 naira. So even minimum wage earners will be able to access this affordable housing through uh, this uh, social housing construction scheme. But the best part is that the 300,000 is just phase one. It's just the immediate phase one. There's a larger phase of millions of homes that we're going to be doing. But starting with phase one, all the contractors, all the labor, and all the raw materials are going to be sourced within this country uh, through a transparent process. And we're very, very excited about that because we're in a hurry to create uh, thousands of jobs, uh, sorry, millions of jobs all across this country. So, that, so agriculture and social housing aside, you will now have, uh, you have a national special public works program. This program is important to the president because it, it has an, a very equitable distribution of benefits. 1,000 young people across all 774 local government areas of this country will be employed to a, be engaged in uh, things like urban and rural sanitation, uh, housing construction, road rehabilitation, uh, even tree planting because we're working very aggressively to counter the effects of desertification in the north because what, of what we're seeing in terms of the effects that that is now having on the uh, counter ins uh, on insurgency and on uh, the, you know, the farmer herdsman clashes and all of the other security uh, issues that have manifested as a result of some of these climatic uh, climate based problems. So there, there's so, mu there's so much uh, involved in this plan. The last thing I would just mention very quickly, I, I haven't explained the whole plan, but the last thing I would mention is we're also putting together an expansion of the social investment programs to an unprecedented rate. We're about to uh, hopefully kick off very soon. Uh, we're just going through the logistics of it now, making sure it's prepared efficiently and properly for execution. 30 million uh, of, our, of our people 
uh, who, are, who are classified as urban poor, Nigerians, will receive uh, alerts. It will be digital payments paid directly into their account. Now, the criteria is twofold. One, who are those individuals who, for the last four months or so, over a four-month, three- or four-month audit period, have had less than 5,000 naira in, uh, in their bank accounts consistently, so that we can dimension them in terms of their access to economic opportunity? Then the other one, the other criteria is, the, is uh, mobile communication. Because we have done so much work over the last four years in terms of cleansing and sanitizing our SIM card biodata reg uh, registration uh, our database, uh, we uh, obviously after the fine of MTN and all the millions of SIM cards that were deregistered uh, following that uh, uh, process, we now have a very accurate picture into those who own SIM cards and we have their bio data, thumbprints, next of kin, all of those things. Now using that data, we can see who are those individuals who consistently over a period of three or four months, just like the BBN, top up their phones, right, with less than 100 naira. So people who are charging up with 13, 13 naira at a time, 20 naira at a time, 15 naira at a time, and all of that, we're able to see that and dimension them accordingly. It is these individuals who are at risk of hunger, right? And we have to address, not, not just, we know that there are people who are uncomfortable in our country, and we're very sympathetic. That's why we're working so hard to mobilize liquidity for MSMEs and all of these other things. But we have to also ensure that those who are at very vulnerable, at real risk of hunger, that we address them first. Uh, for the obvious reasons. And that's why this digital payment program has been put together based on this criteria. And we're excited about the fact that at the push of a button, we're going to be in a position to be able to reach tens of millions of Nigerians at once without any risk of misappropriation or di diversion or corruption. And that's something that the president uh, is really very, very excited about. Do we have a caller on the line? I believe we have a caller on the line. Okay. We have a caller? Okay, great. All right. Let's put uh, the caller through. Hello, good morning. Good morning to you, my brother. Yeah. Um, my name is Adi Wale. I live from Manchester. Um, I think you put me through to a jury Good morning, my brother. I Adi Wale. Yes, please. Go ahead with your question. Please go ahead with your question, my dear brother. Okay, my name is Adebo Ali Talabi from Manchester. Um, I'm calling uh, in Vegas. This is my first, uh, first time um, joining you on the chat. And um, calling you, well, I saw, um, I saw your uh, interview uh, you did about six months ago in regards to um, in regards to the Siemens uh, Power Project, uh, which was lovely. Uh, I watched the whole video, I think you did that interview uh, some time ago. So, um, so basically, the mm -hmm. things you're doing. Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, so I, I, I believe my brother was asking about the Siemens deal. So l let me go ahead and answer uh, that, that question in, in as much as I was able to hear it. Uh, indeed, uh, this is very central uh, to uh, the determination of the president uh, to fundamentally uh, transform the power sector. And, we, and I understand. Our people have heard this thing over and over from government officials, and they're tired. I understand that. Um, 
But we need to communicate with our people very clearly about the difference between what Mr. President is doing and how he has cut out corruption from this process and what happened before. So very quickly, let me just start by saying uh, previous attempts at trying to fix the power sector essentially uh, involved billions of dollars being removed from the excess crude account placed in a government agency. The government agency would now call friends and politicians to be bringing their wives and cousins to uh, take subcontracts and all these different things uh, for various power plants and all these things. Many of them were not completed. Uh, many of them were not started and some were completed but done with a very terrible quality and all of that. That is why we are where we are. Now, what Mr. President has done is to say that we're removing all of that. We're removing po the politicians from, from, the, from the financial aspects of power sector reform moving forward. So very strategically, in August 2018, President Mohamedou Buhari invited German Chancellor Angela Merkel to the presidential villa, where they in engaged in a discussion. And the president was able to agree with her on a new effort uh, to, to have a one-stop shop essentially, that would, a one-stop solution that would deal with all of the faulty components along the, the electricity, electricity sector value chain. That's, of course, generation, transmission, and distribution. Now, Siemens is going to be able to now, the way that the funding mechanism works is that it's 100% it's funded uh, without going through Nigerian bureaucracy. So 80% of the, of, the, of the total money is going to be funded by the German Export Credit Agency they will pay the, the money from the bank to Siemens directly. So the money is staying in Germany. They pay directly to Siemens. Then the, the federal government has a 20% counterpart fund that they pay directly from Federation account, not through all these ministries and all these funny, funny things, from the Federation account direct to Germany. So that all the money is, is, is essentially in Germany for them to pay themselves in our own, in the matter, is just to do project supervision. Make sure that everything, all of the equipment are the, of the standard of what we paid for, making sure that everything is constructed and implemented properly. And we don't have any concern about that because Siemens has already done this in Egypt, in Iraq, and all of that. And the reason why they succeeded in a place like Egypt was because they didn't have corrupt officials who were trying to eat the money that was supposed to be going into the projects. Fortunately, we now have a president who is going to ensure uh, that we do not have uh, corrupt politicians that are able to get their hands into uh, this project. Uh, so that's why it's the Presidential Power Initiative. He has direct oversight over this project. And the procurement, again, is not, is not done in Nigeria at all. Our own is just supervision and implementation. Now, how it works, now that we've discussed funding, is the, the, uh, the, the president directed that Siemens will have sole authority to determine the, the, the contractors that they work with. So instead of a situation where a senator or a minister or somebody is saying, Siemens, you have to use this contractor or you have to use that contractor, and we don't know the history of that contractor, Siemens can now say, ah, we've worked with these people in, uh, in Egypt. We've worked in these, with these people in Germany. Let's bring these people. And they now bring those they know can deliver the quality that they're used to delivering. So for us, we have, we're, very, we're very satisfied with that, and the president has really ring-fenced the project. Now, how the project actually works is that it's in multiple phases. Phase one deals with distribution. Why? Because right now we have capacity to generate uh, 7,000 megawatts. We have a transmission capacity of over 7,000 megawatts, but we have distribution capacity of 2,500 megawatts, so a band of between 2,500 and 3,500, depending on things like whether it's raining or not. So for Nigerians who may not know, if you generate and transmit 1 million megawatts and you can only distribute uh, 100 megawatts into the homes and businesses of Nigerians. It's only 100 megawatts that Nigerians will see in their homes and businesses. So distribution is very, very critical. So now, uh, th because of this deal, the president said, look, uh, Siemens must focus on distribution first before we get into the discussions about power plants and all these other things. Let us deal with distribution so that Nigerians can experience the light that we're currently generating and transmitting uh, and all of that. So what they've done is they've gone around the country in conjunction with all of the stakeholders, the distribution companies and everybody, they've gone around and they've said, look, we're gonna, we, uh, they've done a forensic technical audit of all the distribution infrastructure and all of the various distribution company domains across this country. 
And based on that audit, they will now know, okay, this one needs replacement. This one requires new construction. This one requires removal of this faulty thing, this component and all of that. They do the, the audit. Now, after the audit, which they have done, they now develop the roadmap on, uh, 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 based on the audit. So they know exactly what is needed and where it is needed and all of that. So they now priced it. They now bring the, the, the pricing and then we work through the financing. Just the other day, the president directed the Minister of Finance and the uh, Ministry of Power uh, and the BPE to finalize all of the, 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 the payment issues for phase one, which is again distribution. So now, for Nigerians to understand what phase one means, the, the roadmap says that by the end of 2021, right, and this was before COVID-19 of course, by December 2021, we would go from 2,500 or 3,000 megawatts distribution capacity to 7,000 megawatts distribution capacity, which means that we would be able to fully capture all of the Nigerian power that is generated and transmitted in this country. You will now see it in your homes, in your businesses. So just imagine with me what uh, double your current electricity would be like if you're getting five hours now or you're getting 10 hours now, you double that, you're looking at between 15 and, and 20 hours, for example. That is a very good start for phase one. So that's the end of 2021. Now with COVID-19, it might be like maybe March 2022 or something like that, uh, maybe just a few months off. But that's, that's the roadmap and that's where we're starting from and that's how it works. So Nigerians have no cause for concern in terms of diversion, in terms of it not getting done. The president has constructed it in a manner that it will be impossible to make this fail. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I may, maybe I will just take the opportunity to add, because maybe there will be some curiosity. Phase two deals with uh, the construction of uh, some power plants uh, along the value chain, uh, along the uh, Abuja Kaduna Kano uh, gas pipeline, that, uh, J, sorry, uh, Jeo Kuta Abuja Kaduna Kano gas pipeline. Uh, that would bring Hello. up our generation capacity. So Hello. that the roadmap says the phase two would be Hello. at the Good end morning. of 2023, we'll have 11,000 megawatts. But we're focused on phase one for now. I'm here. I believe we have another caller. All right. Good morning. I just want to add a simple question here. Um, you know, I just want to add a simple question here. Yeah, go ahead, please. How truly sustainable are the social investment programs? I do not see why we project more for social investment than we do for health and education companies. Mm. You see, I, 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 I don't know. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, my brother. Thank you very much for that question. Um, let me just say uh, that, that, that this is... Crazy, uh, crazy. Can we just uh, have a budget that is higher than the education and health combined? Right. Thank you very much. I need to start Jury to play my doubt on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, thank you very much for this question. Now, first of all, the social investment programs uh, are, are being institutionalized. The reason why the social investment programs moved I'm sorry, please. The, 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 the line is still open, if you can. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. The social investment programs uh, have been institutionalized. That's why they were moved from the presidency into the newly created Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management, and Social Development. Uh, it, was for the, this, it was because President Mohamed Buhari looked into the future and said, look, because we have started these programs, because we have created a, a mechanism for 15 million Nigerians currently to benefit, and there will be much more by 2023, uh, we do not want a situation where we leave office in 2023 and then these uh, mil tens of millions of Nigerians that are benefiting uh, will now just lose out. So he now institutionalized it by creating that ministry that can sustainably run uh, those programs. So it's very sustainable. That isn't really a concern for us. Uh, and, and, and it's not just the ministry's cre creation that assures of sustainability. It's also the fact that we're working not just on our own. This is not just a Nigerian government effort. We intentionally co-opted multilateral institutions like the World Bank and others to get involved. We told them, look, 
if you bring grants, you bring money to help us fund these programs, right? We will, in, we will ensure, we want to ensure that there's accountability. So that the World Bank now brought its own monitoring and evaluation mechanisms to ensure that as we go along, as we're administering the program, it's on the basis of our judicious use of the resources and the effective application of those resources that the multilateral agencies like the World Bank will continue giving us the funds that we require to sustain those programs. So it works all the way around, and that's the way that we want it. And that's why you've seen uh, the, the federal government of Nigeria win international awards uh, for the application and implementation of the social investment programs. That doesn't mean that there are not flaws here and there. Of course, anytime you're dealing with millions of people, you will have e errors that you will need to correct. But on the large part and the, large, and the larger sum, you will see that it's been uh, effectively administered. But you raised a very, very critical question. Uh, which is about the comparison of, of, of having social investment programs than the funding uh, to the funding of, say, health and education. I want to be very unequivocal about this. And this can be fact-checked. When you look at the health budget, what you're seeing there is approximately, I might be off a few billion, but approximately between 48 and 50 billion naira. If I'm not mistaken, I believe that's the figure for the, for the 2020 budget allocation to the Ministry of Health. It was this administration uh, under the President Mohamedou Buhari that put together the legislation that said 1% of the consolidated revenue fund must be applied uh, to the health sector. So that now created the BHCPF, the Basic Health Care Provision Fund. Now the BHCPF has a funding, uh, because of the 1% uh, CRF uh, uh, allocation, they are now funded to the tune of almost about, about 45 billion in the 2020 budget, which is almost the same size as the ministry. Why is this important? When people look at health, the health allocation to the Ministry of Health, they often forget that the bulk of the responsibility for health care provision lies in the states. It's not because the president said so. It's because the Constitution said so. The Constitution is very clear that primary health care and primary education are the prerogative, the responsibility of the states. So whatever the federal government is doing in, health, in primary health and in primary education is merely interventionist. It is what they can add to what the states are constitutionally empowered to handle. So now, so when you look at that, and you know that this is the health care funding, right, that has been put in place, and then let's look at education, where you had a similar uh, provision of I think give or take, I can't, remember, I can't remember the figure, but I know it was less than, uh, well less than 100 billion and all of that, and there were some complaints uh, from stakeholders saying we're not investing in education. But we forget that, again, aside from the primary health, uh, education being the bulk of education expenditure, and it's at the state by state level, right, you also have the, the issue of the fact that you have a TET fund that deals with tertiary education that has almost over 200 billion. In 2020, we had over 200 billion uh, for, for the TED fund. So that's not included in the Ministry of Education allocation. And people uh, tend to see that, and they treat the Ministry of Education allocation as the total federal intervention in education. But that's not correct. If you put everything together, you will realize that it, it's, it's closer to 300 uh, and 400 billion, depending on the year. So we put together, and that does not include UBEC, by the way. UBEC is, I think, well over, I think it's over 80 billion or so. It's quite a lot of money. And that is, again, interventionist to assure, ensure that just like the Basic Health Care Provision Fund intervenes in primary health care in the states, you now have UBEC to ensure that uh, our state governments have additional resources uh, according to their capacity to counterpart fund uh, for primary education in their states. Uh, and so, again, when we look at Ministry of Education budget, you're not looking at TED Fund, you're not looking at UBEC, you're only looking at that. And so it looks very, very small. But you put all together, you will now know what the federal government is putting into, into education and all of that. So these are the issues. By the time uh, an objective analysis is done across sectors in terms of federal government responsibility and then federal government allocation, uh, you would recognize that uh, the federal government has actually done uh, quite a lot. Uh, in terms of uh, intervening in these sectors. But that does not now mean that we should rest on our oars. What it means is that we should do better. We should try and raise our revenues so that we can apply even more funds uh, to intervention in health and education because we all know that the future of this country is fully dependent on human capital development. And that is the position of the president. That is the position of this government. And we're going to continue to move uh, in that direction. Uh, so thank you very much for your question. Hello? Yes, my brother, I hear you. You're, we have a caller on the line. Good morning. Good morning, my brother. How are you? Very well. Thank you. I'm trying to 
ask some question or I'm trying to put a question through to our jury on the online uh, live program. Yes, please. Please go ahead. Come again. Please go ahead. Hello? Hello? Yes, my brother, I can hear you. If you can hear me, please go ahead and ask your question, please. Yeah, good morning. How are you? Very well, thank you. Go ahead. My brother, you, nobody is um, nobody is speaking. Can you hear me? To the long-standing issue uh, with the Nigerian Ghana, uh, uh, Nigerian traders in Ghana, and as a matter of fact, I'm calling from Ghana, and I'm asking, what is the president doing with the long-standing issue of Nigeria? The long-standing issue of oh. yes, please. Hello. Yes, my brother. Hello. Good morning. Yes. Good morning to you, my brother. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Hello. I want to ask, okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ebe Eleniko Lobo. I'm coming from Lagos. I, I I want to talk about the, uh, the National Home School Feeding vis-à-vis the uh, Social Investment Program. Um, I observe that, that that program has been, uh, 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 in the last four or five years, has been the driver of this government. And we need to commend the federal government for that initiative. Fantastic job. Presently, the, the Supreme Court is ongoing in Lagos. About Abuja, it has been successful. But I also want to ask some questions. One, the federal government started with five, one to three. What are they doing to also extend the family three, four to six? That's important, very germane, because a lot of people are also agitating that they are in public school between four and six, but they are not getting the food support from government. That's number one. Number two, the the um, empire and creative and creation and everything. They started well, but the thing is going down now. If that's why I've been empowered, those things promises, like for that putting them in internship, mm -hmm. that has not happened at all. So what, are, what is the government doing to make sure those that have changed, that they have to just sustain them and put them in the market for them to sustain themselves? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, my brother. Uh, let me just say that um, when we talk about the homegrown school feeding program, uh, I, I appreciate your acknowledgement of the effort uh, on the part of this administration to put that in place. Obviously, you have about 8.5 million school children in this country benefiting from that. Uh, there's no doubt uh, that in a perfect situation uh, where we have high revenues and we have money to spend and uh, all things are ideal, uh, we would not want to limit it to primary two through four, for example. Uh, we would want to extend it to uh, you know, the entire primary school uh, uh, cater, if you, if you will, across this country. That's the ideal. Uh, but unfortunately for us, we have to make decisions based on the realities of the resources available to us and understanding that we're working with partners who help us in terms of funding and wherever there are restrictions or limitations, uh, these things are, as a re they, they, they are implemented as a result of agreements. So, for example, if World Bank comes and they, says, and they say to us, you know, that, uh, for, that for, in terms of school feeding, it is where children uh, are uh, most effectively uh, met, impacted, in terms of meeting them with nutrition that will impact the long-term future of their academic uh, pursuits. That if you go earlier, you're able to make, have more of an impact on their capacity to learn uh, than if you go later. So if you have to make a choice, if you are forced to make a choice, it's better to go earlier than later. That has been uh, the, the outcome of expert opinion uh, and expert analysis on, on the matter. So we have to go, we had to go with that and we're working with people. So look, uh, at the end of the day, we want to expand it uh, and, and of course we will. That's why we institutionalize the program. 
Uh, but ultimately, that is going to be dependent on the reality of our resources. And we, we're at a, at, a, at a very critical juncture right now where we're making massive investments in roadways and bridges and railways and airports and seaports and dams and power plants, all these different things that are going on, the Siemens deal, all these things going on, uh, this, even this two trillion IRA stimulus. So we have to be very, very meticulous and very methodical and surgical about how we apply the resources that we have. So we want to do more, we will do more, uh, but right now we have to focus in on those very vulnerable uh, segments of, uh, of primary school goers uh, where we can reach them at an age uh, that will have a long-term impact on their ability to learn uh, moving forward. And, 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 and certainly, uh, we sympathize with uh, the, the grade levels that are not uh, in a position yet uh, to be benefiting from the program. But I will add this, this is a very critical thing. There are states that have the capacity, there's nothing stopping states from getting involved, from taking, the, from taking exa example from the federal government's interventions in social investment and saying we will do our own. There's, nothing, there's no constitutional uh, uh, limitation on their ability to conduct social investment uh, programs. So for us, we, we are, uh, the federal government is controlling 52% of the nation's resources, 48 is going to the states and local governments. The capacity is there, particularly in some of the wealthier states, to be able to say, look, okay, if federal government is stepping in to help us with the, to assist us with the two, point, uh, two through four grades in, in the uh, primary education, then maybe we can also step in to go uh, five through six, for example, right? So that there's, there's, there's some synergy, some cooperation there. I, but we have to also convince our state governments, uh, put some maybe a bit of pressure on our state houses of assembly uh, to ensure that they actually prioritize uh, some of these interventions that will make a real difference in the lives of, uh, of their constituents. Because unfortunately, my brother, we're still in a situation where you have some federal lawmakers and some state lawmakers and even some uh, ward, uh, ward leaders at the local government level uh, on some of these uh, councils uh, that, are, that are involved in uh, worrying about how they're going to buy tricycles and all of that as constituency projects. We have to move beyond that. Let's impact our people in a meaningful way. If it's not food, let it be development of education, let it be development of health care, let it be uh, diversification of the economy so that those who cannot go to school will have an opportunity to gain skills, to be able to apply themselves in things like agriculture and some of the other uh, creative sectors. I think, I think this, is, this is an opportunity that we have, but we need to not look at the development of Nigeria as the, sole, as, the, uh, as the exclusive preserve of the federal government of Nigeria. That is not how uh, the federal republic is structured. That is not what the constitution had in mind. And we need to really hold our state and local governments accountable about the development uh, across sectors uh, when we talk about these programs. It's, it's very essential. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Uh, we, in the next uh, two minutes, we're going to uh, take a very short break. Very short break, very brief break, so don't go anywhere. Uh, I fully expect to get more uh, questions. Uh, I want to really dig into some of the concerns that you have, uh, and I want to take time to do that. So please stay with us. Uh, if you have tried calling and you can't get through, please continue trying. Be persistent. I assure you uh, we're doing our very best. Uh, right now, uh, given the traffic, to, uh, to ensure that you are heard. So please do uh, call in and uh, we'll be able to uh, address your questions. But uh, we're just going to take a short break for two minutes and we'll be back in a moment. Do stay with us. They've gone off the stream. Is the stream on or off? Stream. It's off. So it's only two minutes. It has. Oh, okay. I understand, I understand. So w what are they doing now? Dami?
uh, in touch with you so that we can engage. Uh, I believe that right now we have a caller on the line. Uh, please feel free. Do we have a do we have a caller on the line? Okay, great. Hello. Hello. Yes. Good morning, my brother. All right. Good morning. This morning, and how is work? Um, let me not take much of your time. Um, I'm Abu Bakari, calling from Kano, actually. I wanted to ask a very serious issue concerning the entrepreneurship and the flower sector as well. Um, actually, I run a small business and most painful part of my journey so far has been inconsistent power supply. So barely I receive six hours work days. Why can't the government get it right in the power sector? Mm. Yes, th thank so, you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Let me just say that, uh, you know, I, I hope you were tuned in earlier when we were discussing the uh, Siemens Power uh, project and how it works, uh, because that is going to fundamentally alter uh, the experience that you are having uh, in terms of power supply to your business. We certainly sympathize with you. We know uh, how difficult it is out there. Uh, no one is immune. Certainly when I go home, uh, my power cuts out like everybody else. So. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that we have done and we're going to continue to do is aside from the Siemens Power Project, which uh, we're actively involved in, uh, within the Economic Sustainability Plan, which I referenced earlier, I talked about agriculture, I talked about social housing, I talked about uh, the uh, Special Public Works Program, taking 1,000 young people from every local government area in the country, uh, and, and some of the other things. Uh, there's also a major electrification component. How are we going to do that? Uh, within the Economic Sustainability Plan, we have a NACENI, the National, the National Agency for Space and Engineering Infrastructure. Has, we have very brilliant, under, underrated uh, engineers. We have such capacity in this country. We, don't, uh, we have not uh, uh, tended to appreciate our capacity. We tend to appreciate our capacity when we see our capacity in Germany and U.S. and all these places. But the ones here, we tend to pretend as if they don't have the same capacity as those who are working in Germany. But we have, in fact, even more so. So for us, we want to leverage that now. And within NACENI, uh, we have a series of partnerships with China and some other countries developing uh, in indigenous technologies around solar power. So what we're doing within the Economic Sustainability Plan is within the next uh, tw 24 months, uh, beginning with the first phase, we are going to put together 5 million solar home units. That is the solar home systems. These are solar powered uh, off grid home uh, power solutions that will enable our rural communities, focused on rural communities, uh, to be able to indigenously manufacture, distribute, and maintain solar home systems for 5 million uh, rural Nigerian households. This will be unprecedented because when you're talking of households, you're talking of groups of people. You're talking of about 25 million Nigerians living in our rural communities across the nation, every state of this country, that are going to benefit from this component of the economic sustainability plan uh, led by Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibajo. And I have personally had the privilege of, of sitting in those meetings during the consultations. And I can tell you uh, that when we talk about implementation, and making sure that the plan on paper is actually manifesting on the ground the way that it is on paper. The vice president has been asking very tough questions, very hard questions, pointed questions of all the uh, members of the committee to ensure that every potential uh, problem, every potential flaw or every potential obstacle has a solution so that we get from start, which is conception of the idea, down to the finish, which is the fullest implementation of the project. And we have been able to, uh, the, the Economic Sustainability Committee has been able to uh, effectively do that across sectors, across programs, across projects. So with rural housing, uh, for businesses, uh, I don't know, my brother, if uh, your business is located in an urban center or if it's located off-grid in our rural communities, uh, in one of our rural communities, but I want to assure you 
uh, that whether you're in the city center, if you're on the grid, Siemens, the Siemens project is going to take care of that. If you're off grid, what we're doing in terms of this un unprecedented move uh, at solar, uh, at solar uh, systems, independent solar uh, power systems, uh, is going to uh, ameliorate the suffering of uh, rural businesses, uh, which, of which you may be one. So we're looking at a very comprehensive uh, approach to this. We start with 5 million systems benefiting 25 million uh, rural dwellers, and we want to escalate that to 25 million systems benefiting over 100 million uh, rural dwellers uh, over the next five years. So that's the plan, and we, we are absolutely committed to implementing it. And I want to assure you also uh, that the funding for that plan uh, has been uh, fully realized. We're not going to be looking for money uh, and all of that. So everything is in order, and by God's grace, I'll be back here uh, to be able to update you on the progress of, of that plan and many others. Thank you very much for calling in. Good morning. Am I on to here in Nigeria, right? Yes, my brother. Good, good morning to you. All right. Yeah, my name is Nandi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, yeah, um, I'd like to comment that uh, President Buhari has uh, done remarkably well in the last uh, 365 days, and but the fight uh, against corruption has really not uh, lived up to people's expectations. So my question is, um, is there anything uh, further the president can do to fight corruption more effectively now? Mm. Thank you. Wow, that's an excellent question uh, and a very important one because really, obviously, when we talk corruption, we're talking about what affects every single sector in this country, affects our people at every level of the society. It's comprehensive. Um, so uh, in terms of solutions, uh, we know, I think any dispassionate uh, observer uh, would acknowledge the fact uh, that we have seen what we have never seen before. Uh, in Nigerian history under this administration as it relates to anti-corruption. We still have a ways to go. Uh, there's still a lot of improvement to be made, uh, but we have done quite a lot, uh, this president has. And I want to be very clear in terms of the st statistics, uh, what I'm talking about. If you look at uh, the latest figures from the EFCC, uh, between 2009 and two 2019, that's 10 years, 2009 to 2019, Nigeria recovered, the EFCC in particular, recovered 1.2 trillion naira. We're talking naira. We're not talking of uh, euro recoveries, dollar recoveries, pound recoveries, all of these other instruments. We're talking only naira recoveries now. 1.2 trillion naira was recovered in that 10-year period, 2009 to 2019. Now, in the first six years of that period, that is 2009 to 2015, out of the 1.2 trillion naira, less than 300 billion was recovered by the EFCC. Within the last four years, 939 billion out of the 1.2 trillion naira has been recovered under this administration. So in, in two less years, we have recovered more than three times the money. So um, we, we have done a lot. A lot has been done, but more can be done. And that's, that's the focus. If you're talking about prosecutions, uh, imprisonment, and all of that, we have seen it. We have seen now a sitting chief whip of the Senate uh, being prosecuted and now imprisoned for example. Uh, and of course, this is not just a member of the ruling All Progressives Congress, but also a personal friend of President Muhammadu Buhari, and there was no interference to stop uh, what ultimately happened. Um, you have other instances where you have senators uh, who have been imprisoned and all of that. Two of them happen to be, again, uh, members of the APC for those who have alleged that there is a selective justice taking place. That clearly uh, is not based on fact. So these are some of the things. Uh, they are, they are, but prevention, is better than cure. And for us, uh, I, I think it's extremely important to note that within the first one year of the second term administration of President Mohamedou Buhari, we have seen two very key moves that I think have been totally underestimated and downplayed. One was in uh, June, uh, as of June 1st, just a few days after Mr. President uh, took his oath of office for the second time uh, on May 29th, 2019. Just a few days, effective on June 1st, 2019, last year, we had the establishment, implementation, in effect, of the new guidelines of the Nigeria Financial Intelligence Unit, which ensured that for the, this thing we have been crying about for decades, since 1999, we have been crying and agitating about local governments having their funds being hijacked by state governors and state governments. 
uh, with this uh, imbroglio around state and local government joint accounts, allocations and all of that. The president, in, on, as soon as he was sworn in uh, for his second term, put a stop to that with the NFIU guidelines implementation. So that has been done. In fact, if you look at a, a lo one local government, just as an example of what I'm talking about, one local government, Yola South in Adamawa, I'm not talking of River State and in Lagos where you have so much allocation. In Yola South in Adamawa, they had not had more than 500,000 Naira in their local government account since 2002. I'm talking of 2019, since 2002, for 17 years, it never rose above 500,000 Naira. That is the kind of neglect and deprivation we're talking about. One local government, Yola South. At the, the first month that the NFIU guideline was put into place from June 1st to July 1st, 2019, they received 120 plus million Naira in that account. One month. So that's what we're talking about. Yeah. So if we're talking about grassroots yeah, no, development, these are the kinds of uh, prevention, uh, prevention type of measures that the president has put in place. I'm sorry, please. There's some interference on the line. Okay, there's another caller. I, ju I just want to just very, very quickly wrap up the point by saying, aside from the NFIU guideline, we have just seen the president operationalize the constitutional amendment for uh, the, uh, the financial autonomy for states, le legislature, and judiciary. I think that this is going to be a very important move in terms of uh, maintaining, of, 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 uh, of establishing and bolstering checks and balances at the state and local level where uh, so much of the uh, indiscretion and lack of transparency takes place. So these are some of the prevention steps that can be taken in addition to what the president is doing on the back end uh, to deal with it once it has already uh, gone into manifestation. So thank you very much for your question. We have another caller. Okay. Uh, good, uh, good morning. Good morning to you, my brother. Thank you for being patient and calling in. My question is, uh, restructuring is uh, supposed to be in the APC party manifesto. Please, can, uh, can uh, Ajure, Mr. Ajure tell me why is the president interest in restructuring the country, this country? Many of us see that there will be greater APC and uh, unity if we finally we or restructure this country for mm. benefit of all Nigerians. Please, I'm waiting for the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, my dear brother. L uh, let me just say that uh, you will not wait long for your answer. Um, the issue of restructuring has obviously been a contentious one uh, for quite a long time. Uh, you, we have obviously seen, I think, 2017, was the year where it was like the beginning and end of every conversation. Everybody wanted to discuss restructuring in 2017. Uh, but we also know, of course, we, rec we recall under the previous administration that a, a national conversation, a national uh, delegatory conference was held uh, and, uh, w you know, there were a lot of outcomes and people had conversations around the country from different parts of the country about how the country should be reconfigured and all of that. So restructuring has been in the national uh, dialectic for uh, quite a long time. I think now the question is about how do we define restructuring? So many different people have so many different definitions. For some people, restructuring is re return to regional parliamentary system of government. For some people, it is, uh, a, 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 for, believe it or not, unitary style of government. For some people, it is a deeper uh, form of true federalism where we really devolve almost everything to the states and local governments and say, oh yeah, you people run this country and we will just sit in the center and, uh, and uh, we'll just moderate the conversation. So different people have different ideas about restructuring and what it entails. Some people think it's the creation of more states in one place or the reduction of states in another place and all of that. So it's a very, it's a very uh, equivocal uh, term and we have to be very precise about what it is we mean by restructuring. Now, within the, uh, the APC manifesto, which you uh, referred to, uh, I, I, I believe the, the notion of restructuring uh, was also left to be defined by uh, those individuals who uh, would take part in the conversation. So it wasn't a final product where you say this is the way it's done. But they, I, I believe a committee was set up by, chaired by uh, uh, Governor El Rufai of Kaduna State that basically brought out a series of recommendations as to what restructuring should mean and how it should be implemented in accordance with their own uh, party manifesto and all of that. 
Now, with that said, the president is not somebody who talks too much. Uh, he's an action man. He's more focused on what are those tangible steps I can take as the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria that would ensure that we can actually get to the point of restructuring uh, right, without talking too much about it. We've had people who were at the highest levels of power in this country who did nothing about restructuring when they had power. When they were in power, they didn't even, the word restructuring did not even come out uh, of their lips. So these are some of the people that have been campaigning on restructuring, making it the issue that uh, is burning on the front pages of newspapers and all of that. So I think we, all should, should, we should also be mindful of the motivations that are driving certain people to do what they're doing, and then we will now know the sincerity of what we're talking about when we talk about restructuring. But I'll just wrap up by saying that the president as a man of action, has taken uh, tangible steps toward restructuring. And I referred to one of them just a moment ago. Uh, one, we talk about local government autonomy. And we talk about ensuring that local governments have the facility, the funding that they require that is constitutionally owed to them to be able to uh, you know, uh, con uh, conduct uh, infrastructural development, to conduct uh, you know, the, you know, the kinds of social policies in their respective domains, that they're able to do so. Of course, they have been hamstrung now for decades, and nobody, no president was ready to do what the president, what President Muhammadu Buhari has finally had the political will to do. He didn't do it because it was easy. He didn't do it because the state governors would be smiling and dancing that, that he's taking local government funds and giving to local governments directly. Of course, there's going to be opposition, but he had the political will to say, this is the right thing to do, and I'm going to do it in the interest of our people because the funds that are going to the local governments of this country deserve to be enjoyed by the people that are living in those local governments. And that's the position of the president. And so he, 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 he embarked on and implemented that form of a restructuring. The next one is the one that just happened with executive order number 10 and the financial autonomy granted uh, to the state's uh, legislature and judiciary. What does that entail? When we talk restructuring, we're, we're talking top-down restructuring, devolution of powers. What are those federal powers that maybe states should now have? Uh, you know, conversations around state police and all of that. That is a vertical process, a vertical type of restructuring. How about horizontal restructuring? How about the fact that you have an, uh, an over-concentration of power in the executive branch, particularly at the state levels? And I want to be very precise because some people will say, ah, well, isn't federal government the same thing? Doesn't federal executive have too much power? My, 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 my viewers, please, oh, look at this thing. The judiciary, uh, in 2014, the federal allocation to the judiciary was 68 billion naira. Today, as of 2020 budget, 110 billion naira. It was almost doubled to give that financial uh, autonomy uh, to the judiciary at the federal level. At the national, uh, for the federal legislature, the, one of the major criticisms we get is that the, 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 the federal legislature gets too much money that we don't know what they're doing with all this money. Nobody ever says federal executive is denying uh, federal legislature money and making them to be uh, you know, vulnerable to the whims of the federal executive. But at the states, it is not so. At the states, it's the opposite, where state houses of assembly are crying that we don't have funds. And so they have to go to the state governor and beg for money. And therefore, the state governor can afford to say, you're going to do whatever I want. If, you, if I want you to sign a multi-billion naira pension bill to favor me and my colleagues, that's what you will do. Uh, same thing with the state judiciary. So with that executive order number 10, we have reversed that. And we have asked the state governments to follow the example of Mr. President and in ensuring that there is financial autonomy uh, for, the, for the other branches so that we can bolster checks and balances and restructure in such a manner that we, uh, you know, take that centralization of power and decentralize it to the legislature and to the judiciary so that there can be a proper uh, checks and balance the way that it was initially envisaged by the nation's constitution. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't take too long on that answer, but it required an explanation. All right, looks like we have another caller on the line. Okay. Uh, good, morning. good morning to you, my brother. Uh, my name is Inyolo Marshall. Welcome. And uh, I'd like to um, commend you for a, a job well done, for informing um, us. Um, but in particular, I would like to come from the angle of um, farmers. I come from a family of farmers, and I must say that the president is doing um, a fantastic job. Over the last five years, he has um, invested and done a lot. However, I want to ask what further support can government provide 
especially during this post mm. COVID-19 um, times yeah. to help Nigerian farmers produce more as we hope to feed ourselves in this populous nation, Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, my brother. Um, yeah, very important question again. Um, you know, aside from what I mentioned in terms of the economic sustainability plan uh, and how we are doing a massive land clearing and cultivation exercise in conjunction with the state governments who are supplying us the land, we are supplying millions of young people uh, very soon as, as labor to get it done. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have just uh, signed the $1.2 billion dollar a uh, green imperative deal uh, with the Brazilian government. In fact, just the Federal Executive Council rather uh, just approved that within the last few weeks, uh, the $1.2 billion facility to be accessed. How it is going to work is this. Uh, we understand that we are comparatively disadvantaged with the Vietnams and the South Koreas and the Asian Tigers when it comes to agricultural production. Why? Because in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, when these people were busy mechanizing the agricultural processes, moving away from the very archaic, antiquated, uh, manual uh, labor farming techniques, uh, you know, they were mechanizing. We, we didn't. And we are, now, uh, we are now decades and generations behind these people. So that's why when we take, the, uh, we, we take imported rice, it doesn't have stones. There's a higher quality. Why? because they have, they, have, they have resolved their process issues, while we have not. We are now at the point where we're finally, with border closure and all of the other incentives, anchor borrowers program, uh, the president cutting, uh, the anchor borrowers program obviously pre uh, creating low interest facilities uh, for farmers across the nation to get the liquidity needed to access seedlings, to access uh, all of the various items they need, fertilizer and all of the things that they need, has obviously allowed us to rapidly and massively enhance production and substitute our imports. But, and uh, the last thing I would just mention quickly is slashing the price of fertilizer by the, build, by the uh, construction of about 20 different uh, fertilizer blending plants across the country over the last three years. All of that has gone to make agricultural production uh, move further ahead. Now, mechanization is the key for us to get to where we really want to go, for us to compete with Vietnam and all of that. So the, the, the Green Imperative deal, the $1.2 billion deal, establishes 780 service centers across all local government areas of this federation. What it, how it works is that out of the 780, you have about 632, give or take, 632 service centers where we would have equipped and trained our young people, not just young people, by the way, even those who are middle-aged, who are, who are handy, who are able, uh, even though I've been focusing a lot on young people because of the youth bulge we have and the focus we are really giving to our young people now, uh, but uh, it's going to be open to everybody. And for us, it's very, very critical that we are in a position to give them the skills they need to not only assemble, uh, manufacture, uh, and, uh, and maintain. I'm sorry, uh, one moment, please. I'm just going to finish my response before I go on to the next caller. The, the, the maintenance of the uh, mechanical instruments, like new tractors, that are going to be uh, uh, produced in Nigeria, according to the deal, which is how the president intended. Every leg of the process is, is done in Nigeria for the benefit of Nigerians and jobs created for Nigerians. So you're going to have every local government producing and distributing uh, tractors and other agricultural mechanical equipment to our farmers, local government by local government, so that they have access to them and so that we put ourselves in a position where we don't do the usual Nigerian thing of procuring, we watch it break down and then we buy more. No, now we're going to maintain them and we're going to create jobs in the maintenance of these items. So that's 632 out of the 780. So what remains is about 148 centers. Now, those centers are not going to be for production and distribution and maintenance of mechanical equipment. Those centers are going to be what we call agro-processing centers. The president has wisely seen that Africa for decades has been a, a, an exporter of raw materials. That's what we do. We take raw materials, whether it's raw cassava, raw cocoa, raw everything, and we export it. Now, the president knows, just like uh, other actors in the international community, that raw materials tend to fluctuate massively, whether it's oil, raw crude oil uh, and gas products, whether it's cocoa, whatever it is, they fluctuate uh, you know, very dramatically according to seasons and demand and consumption and all of that. Whereas finished products, they do not. 
they don't fluctuate, they stay the same. So for example, instead of sending our soybeans as we have been doing, we send our soybeans raw to Germany, they refine it for us, put it in a plastic uh, container that has a fancy color, sell it back to us. We, used our hard, uh, we use our hard earned dollars to pay four times for that vegetable oil. We're uh, keeping those German factories open at our own expense without any jobs being created here. So now what the president has done is these 148 centers are agro processing centers, which means that we are finally going to have value additive processing for all of our raw materials. So instead of exporting cocoa, we will now be exporting chocolate. Instead of exporting soybeans, we'll be exporting vegetable oil across value chains. So those agro processing centers are very strategic in our bid uh, to deepen and, and expand uh, our portfolio of, uh, of, of high value export commodities across agriculture and across even, even pharmaceuticals and some of the other areas that we want to go into. So that's how the green imperative works. We are going to me mechanize and we're going to me mechanize quickly. And that green imperative deal is going to create 5 million jobs yeah, uh, for our people. So, all, all right, we have another caller on. I hope I answered your question uh, sufficiently. I, 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 I hope I did. All right, the next Hello, caller. Good morning. Good morning to you, my brother. Good morning. Where are my sisters? I'm not hearing my sisters. My or why are my sisters not calling me? Only, only men. Huh? I want to ask, we all know that there is an unemployment problem in the country, as it says today. Mm. How is government realistically going to achieve the president's pledge to lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty by 2029? Mm, mm, mm. Yes. Great question. Thank you very much for that question. So uh, the president's pledge, very historic, saying we're going to bring 100 million of our people out of poverty in the next 10 years from 2019 uh, to 2029. Uh, now, it, very, very critical that we understand that the economic sustainability plan is just a part of what we're talking about when we talk about job creation and, and, and uh, elevating our people up out of poverty. We are at a very strategic moment in international history right now where before COVID-19, and this anybody, anybody who uh, is, is, understands the, the nature and dynamics of global economics and global supply chains would affirm that before, uh, before COVID-19, China was either the beginning or end of supply chains across sectors, across goods, across uh, value, uh, value chains. Now, what COVID-19 did was it showed the West, the wealthy industrialized West, the Germanys, the US's, the UK's, and all of these people, French and all of them, that if you continue to put all of your eggs in the, your manufacturing and industrial eggs in the China basket, as soon as there's a crisis in China, the, the entire global economy will fall off the table with it. That's the lesson of COVID-19. So now we are beneficiaries of that. Why? First of all, we have a massive pool of, uh, of, 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 of a massive market to offtake locally produced and manufactured goods. The same way that China and India have the same benefit. They have the same uh, potential. We have that potential. We have a massive uh, ratio of, of, of college educated graduates, college graduates in this country that are not employed. You have people in our country now that are PhD holders who are driving trucks for Dangote, for example. You know, so we have, we have so many educated people. And then we have people who didn't have the opportunity to go to school, but are highly skilled because they've worked as apprentices uh, in different parts of the country, from the southeast to the southwest to the north, and all of that. So they have skills, ready-made skills to put into application. So we have all of those benefits. So now, what we had lacked is hard infrastructure, power supply, roads, bridges, airports, seaports, uh, of course, soft infrastructure, regulatory reforms, uh, ease of doing business. But what has the president been doing for the last five years? Of course, he has been dealing with these, uh, these lacunas, these shortfalls. So in soft infrastructure, we have seen uh, Nigeria move up. In three years, we have moved up 39 spots on the World Bank's ease of doing business rankings. Two of the last three years, we have been named top 10 global most improving, most improving uh, global economies in the world, top 10 in the entire world two of the last three years in terms of regulatory reforms. And I can lay out the specific measures that the World Bank cited 
uh, as a, uh, to, to, to lift us the way that they have lifted us in terms of our regulatory reforms from CAC registration automation uh, to the automation of our, our tax filing system uh, to the uh, intervention. That's just the executive. In the legislature, we established the collateral, uh, uh, put into law the Collateral Registry Act. We put into law the Credit Reporting Act uh, so that now pe uh, stakeholders and business administration are able to see the credit rating of stakeholders that they're dealing with. With the collateral registries now, we've established a natural, national collateral registry within the Central Bank of Nigeria that allows uh, for people who don't have assets, who don't have money uh, or, or, or you know fixed assets like a home, for example, uh, to put as collateral. Now you can use movable assets, uh, movable collateral such as a tractor, such as a car, such as you know some of these things that are high value but they're movable. Now we have put it into law that you can use movable assets to, to as collateral to gain access to liquidity and and, facili and loan facilities from the central bank and from other uh, various uh, financial institutions in the country. So all of these things go a long way in terms of uh, easing the process of doing business in Nigeria. The last point I would mention is I've, I've mentioned executive legislature in terms of ease of business, but even the judiciary. The two commercial capitals of this country, Lagos and Kano, their high courts, the chief judges of those high courts put into effect uh, major guidelines uh, that change the game for small claims courts so that before you would have two businesses that have a commercial dispute, right? They will have some sort of dispute and it would go into adjournment, adjournment, bribe, adjournment, adjournment and all of that. And these things would not get resolved and it would dissuade people from doing business in Nigeria. Well, in those two courts now within Lagos and Kano, you now have a limit that was placed on adjournments to ensure that People have to start and finish their case within a fixed time frame. And they've also allowed for new alternative dispute res uh, resolution mechanisms like mediation and other uh, mechanisms to ensure that people have alternative means of uh, resolving disputes without going through a lengthy process and all of that. These are all the finer details that the World Bank came in, did a, their own on-spot assessment and said, wait, oh, these people in Nigeria are serious. And it's on the basis of that that they've now been able to upgrade us. So soft infrastructure is being dealt with. We see the roads across the country. We see the Second Niger Bridge, the Lagos Ibadan Expressway, Boni Bodo Road, which is now going to link uh, the NLNG in Boni Island to the mainland for the first time in our national history, which means it's going to facilitate the movement of gas products as we strategically pivot from oil products into gas over the next five years. Uh, NLNG trains, uh, train seven, $12 billion investment that's going to increase our gas production capacity by over a third. That is a major component of, of, of the future of the Nigerian economy. All of these things that are, are being put in place so that we can gas power uh, industry that will be coming into the country, it's all being done so that we can attract those industries, attract those factories, attract those organizations uh, that are pivoting out of China in the post-COVID-19. They can come here and bring in those jobs. And I haven't even gone into the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement in 2021, which is going to bring in uh, over a trillion dollars and hundreds of millions of jobs to the African continent. And it's Nigeria that will be battling with South Africa, Ghana, uh, Kenya, uh, and all of these are Egypt and uh, Morocco and all of these other countries for those factories and for those organizations and for those jobs. We're battling. So we have to prepare ourselves for that battle. And the only way you do that is by creating the kind of soft and hard infrastructure uh, that the president is putting in place. And ultimately, that is how uh, we're going to be able to lift 100 million people out of poverty uh, over the next 100 years. So there's really a lot uh, to look forward to uh, in terms of the, the economic sustainability plan and then post economic sustainability plan, uh, how we're going to build on uh, the opportunities that are going to present themselves from the African Continental Free Trade Agreement implementation uh, and many others. Uh, thank you very much for that question. All right, we have uh, just a few minutes left. So with the next, next few minutes, we have about until 12 o'clock or so. So we can, go for, we can go to the WhatsApp and Facebook questions, which I can uh, see here. Let me start from, uh, we have a question on, okay, let's see here. All right, we have a question from Mr. Abba Salisu Danfaga from Abuja. He says, citizens are still finding it difficult acknowledging the works and reforms of government generally. 
there's a huge gap in communication. Please, what are the, uh, what are the mechanisms that, that I think can be put in place to put the citizens and the government on the same page at all levels? Fantastic question, my brother. Um, I think this, this is just one small component part of that process. Uh, for such a long time, uh, we have had challenges dating back to the 19, really to the, uh, to the uh, just, you know, immediate independence period. Where as soon as, you know, kind of the military took over, uh, you had a situation where everything became top down, right? So it's not, a, it's not an engagement. It's more about, it's more about directive. So the idea has always been a one-way form of communication, a monologue in Nigeria, where governments, whether civilian or military, they will issue press releases, they will expect people to just swallow the press release and just take it like that. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, what that has done is it has created this sense of despondency uh, within the civilian population of our people to say, look, we don't, we don't interact with government. They're there and we're here and there's a gap. And the reason why is because of this one-way form of communication that has existed for a long time. So for us now, we have to now, uh, how do we leverage on technology like this now, for example, to ensure that we can bridge that gap? Uh, you know, the media has in uh, disintermediated around the world with social media. So instead of waiting on uh, NTA to call you or AIT to call you or channels to call you to talk or to engage with people. Now you can engage directly with people and we have to be able to leverage on that technology as we're doing today uh, to be able to bridge that gap so that you can reach me directly and it's not just it's not just a situation where uh, you're listening to what a journalist is saying about government. Now you can hear from government and you yourself can be the journalist asking government the hard questions. And that's what, that is what is going to move this nation forward. That is what uh, developed countries uh, are, are able to leverage on. I think, I think we're taking steps in that direction. Ultimately, the goal is to create a dialogue in the country. We have to be able to hear ourselves. That's, it's not just for the sake of uh, bridging the gap, but it's also for social cohesion. Ultimately, even if a government has the best intentions, the best laid plans uh, for, for, for the administration of a country, if people don't know how to key into it because it's not being communicated effectively, then ultimately it's going to flounder at the point of implementation. So we have to carry people along and, we, and people also have to believe that they have a sense, they have a stake and what is going on. And it's not just some uh, abstract government that's hovering up there doing what they want to do and we're down here and there's nothing for us. And we have to now bridge that and say, look, uh, especially when you have a sincere government, because for so long, not only was it a one-way communication, but while it was one way, uh, people were looking up and seeing government do all sorts of nonsense. They're spending billions of dollars on power that doesn't exist. They're telling people all sorts of lies about this program, that program that doesn't exist. Brothers and wives are getting rich and all of that. So there's going, there has been a lot of distrust that has built up over time. And for us to be able to create trust, it's going to be this dialogue process and also ensuring that if we say Siemens is coming to correct the power situation in the country by 2023, for example, then by 2023, that thing has to be done. Because that is how you build trust. It's not by talking. It's by making sure that the action that you have, you have expressed, that you have, uh, that you have uh, discussed, that that action is fulfilled, it's implemented, it's manifest in the lives of people. That's when they will say, ah, a jury told us in 2020 that this thing will be done. Now in 2023, it has been done. And all of a sudden, people can now begin to trust uh, when uh, spokesmen come out to speak about government efforts. And I have the luxury of knowing that President Muhammadu Buhari is a president who is in he is in he is an all action man he's concerned with the deliverables how will you make sure that this thing we're saying we will do how will it be done on the ground i want to see it and that's the kind of president that's the kind of vice president we have in this country now men of integrity men that want to develop this country and so for us it's just about making sure that the people know the truth about what is going on as opposed to trying to deceive people with propaganda about what is not going on which of course has been our history so there's a lot of work to to do, but we also have to key into the state governments. State governments have information apparatuses too, state ministries of communication, uh, state broadcasting services. We need to align in such a way 
that all of the information from across the country at all levels, federal level, state level, local government level, uh, is effectively communicated uh, to our people. And we also have to be aware of the fact that many of the private media in the country uh, are affiliated, te they tend to be affiliated politically, which obviously compromises the purity of the news and the information you're getting because they decide what is important for you to hear. So if they want you to focus on, uh, uh, you know, herdsmen or goats, then they will have you focus on herdsmen and goats. But if they, if they want you to know about Siemens, they can tell you about Siemens. But there's a reason why many of our people have never heard of the Siemens deal. Even as far as we've gone in the process, people have not heard about it, simply because there are some who decide what you hear and what you don't hear. So this is, these are the challenges, but we're leveraging on technology to make sure that we can create a direct link to overcome some of the challenges that I've just described. Thank you very much for, for, uh, show, uh, for giving light uh, to, that, to that concern. Hello. Hello, my brother. Welcome to the program. Hello. Yes, my brother. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. This is Abdullah who's speaking from Tani. Yes. Uh, I have two questions for the SSA, for the president. Um, uh, my first question goes as well. I wanted to know the current situation on the Lagos, Kanu, Railway plan. As it started, when it will start, and uh, is it going to be completed during the tenure of the president? Mm. The specific. Then my second question is, I've had um, a lot about the semen deal. So what I want to know very specific is we are having currently problems we've had of issues that emanated from the TPS, like the abort and the wrangling between the are we sure that this cannot have, not affect the implementation plan of the president? Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. You know, um, the, one of the reasons why I'm very grateful to you for calling in uh, is because there's a lot of aptitude behind those questions. And, uh, you know, when you talk about the Siemens uh, deal, two of the issues that have come up in terms of the public debate, because I have been following, it's my, it's my job to know what is being said and uh, what issues need to be addressed and what, and all of that. One of the things that I've seen quite consistently uh, when people have discussed the Siemens deal is this notion that, first of all, they've said, ah, is it not the same Siemens that uh, was involved in some sort of a corrupt transaction at, at some point in the last uh, 20 years or whatever the case is, and all of that? That has been a concern. I want to just take a moment to address that. First of all, it's important to note that ultimately what happens in a nation in terms of administration, public administration, it stems from the motivation and content of the leadership, public leaders at all levels. So if a leader is corrupt and his goal is to make money, his goal is to steal, right? Then he's never going to have difficulty finding contractors, whether it's a, a, a company called Siemens or a company called this company or that company. Any company, that, we see it in the oil companies as well. That's why Deep Offshore uh, amend, uh, 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 Production Contract Sharing uh, Act was not amended until uh, last year, uh, you know, until, you know, at the end of last year. So when you have corrupt leadership, ultimately they are going to determine how serious contractors are going to be. When a contractor, a, a contractor can be a five-star world-class contractor. He can give you the very best work, the very best of everything. But when when he's, he knows he's dealing with serious administrators who want work to get done the way that it's supposed to get done, they do it accordingly. But when they're sitting across the table from a corrupt leader, right, who wants to steal money, then it's not a problem for them to say, ah, well, this man is corrupt, so 
Uh, are we going to deny money that will be going to our shareholders and all of that? That's, that's the pragmatic set. That's the pragmatic, maybe cynical, or you can say the word wicked, but that is the way that global business is done, if we're being honest. Whether there a lot of companies in the world do not necessarily have inbuilt uh, integrity. Many companies, de their integrity is dependent, in many cases, on who they're dealing with in, when, in terms of public leaders. That's the reality. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or not, but that is the reality. Now, when we talk about Siemens, the uh, Siemens, first of all, the leadership is different, number one. It's a completely different, 20 years later, it's a completely different set of leaders. Number two, it's not Nigerian government and Siemens. The president intentionally, like he did with all of these other uh, deals that he has signed with Brazil and uh, China and the U.S. And, and all these other, it's government to government. So it's government, uh, German government the, the, with Nigerian government. And so we operate th in terms of the funding and how it works with the German, uh, a German uh, 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 run uh, state bank, the German Export Credit Agency, or at least they have some uh, link with that bank. Uh, the reason why we did that is to ensure that we don't have those kinds of uh, opportunities for corrupt transactions to take place. Our own is to make sure that we get all of the goods that we pay for, and that's the key. So ultimately, we will be repaying a facility that the Germans will be paying uh, to Siemens. So that issue of Siemens being corrupt or this company being corrupt or that company being corrupt, uh, it doesn't arise. The, the second issue is the issue of uh, if, if there's any kind of internal problem uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, what, unions and all of that and all of that. At the beginning of this process, we brought everybody on board. We brought everybody on board to say, look, this is the situation. Uh, how are we going to get the solution? So everybody was part of forming the solution that we now have in our hand. Yes, there, there may be, within unions, you're always going to have power play and intrigues and uh, statements and all of that. That's, that's run of the mill. But in terms of how this thing is...